So, good evening to you all. My name is Christoph Paulus and I'm a senior researcher here at the Asser Institute on International Humanitarian Law and International Criminal Law. And I'm also a research fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism here in the, the ICCT. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to another lecture in the context of HILEC, which, is the, which stands for the Hague Initiative Follow on Conflict. And this is a lecture series on IHL that has been organized since 2005 by the Austrian Institute in cooperation with the Netherlands Red Cross and also the Amsterdam Center for International Law. And tonight is a special highlight lecture since it's organized also in cooperation with the ICCT, I already mentioned it, which is an independent uh, think and do tank uh, providing multidisciplinary policy advice and practical solution-oriented implementation support on prevention and the rule of law, which are two vital pillars of effective counterterrorism. Now, we're very proud to have with us tonight Dr. Uh, Lial Sunga. Dr. Sunga is the head of the Rule of Law program at the Hague Institute for Global Justice, and he's also a visiting professor at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law in Sweden. And he's conducted monitoring, investigation, reporting, technical cooperation, training, and teaching in some 55 countries over the last 25 years in human rights, humanitarian law, and international criminal law. And tonight, Dr. Sunga will speak about international law, including IHL, uh, but also other subfields such as international criminal law and whether it can meet the challenges of uh, today's lawless conflicts. So, Dr. Sunga, thank you so much for having accepted our um, invitation, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, well, it's a it's a real pleasure to um, to have been invited and to to speak with uh, uh, to speak here tonight on a topic which uh, I think is an important one, and um, especially coming to the Astor Institute, which has such a long history and so famous for the substance uh, and its research and its training in international humanitarian law and in other related fields. So it's a, it's a real uh, a pleasure for me to, 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 to come here and, and address you tonight. Well, um, today the, um, the topic that, that uh, we'll be discussing is can international law meet the challenges of today's lawless conflicts, rather loosely speaking. And I'll explain what I mean as, as we go. And ho hopefully I will have uh, ample time as well for questions and answers and to uh, kick around some, some of the ideas that, uh, you know, I'll, uh, some of the issues I'll be raising. So let me just make sure this thing works. There we go. Well, um, the title is the, is the same title uh, of an article that, <clears throat> that I used, uh, you know, in, um, that I published in the Guardian newspaper the day after the Paris attacks. And that article uh, stirred up some, some debate and got some attention. I, I didn't really expect it. Uh, it somehow resonated a bit. And it argued that today's lawless conflicts involve terrorism that is um, itself much more dangerous than past times. And that uh, these kind of conflicts are not adequately addressed by the, the fields of uh, domestic criminal law and uh, transnational criminal law, even, even where you have uh, cooperation among states. It's still very difficult to deal with this issue. And international criminal law and the laws of war, you know, the international humanitarian law, is also um, finding itself rather um, limited in terms of ad adapting to new circumstances. So it discusses some possible ways to meet better the challenges of today's lawless conflicts. So this evening, what I'd like to do is develop the argument, uh, you know, more fully than what I could do in a, in a newspaper editorial. First, by uh, lawless conflicts. I don't mean that uh, law doesn't apply uh, to certain conflicts, but that certain parties have been behaving as if it doesn't. So first point. Second, by conflict, of course I'm really talking about armed conflict and not uh, other types of conflict, social conflict or religious conflict, although obviously uh, these kind of conflicts can be intertwined or uh, reinforcing uh, cleavages in society, etc., and can lead to armed conflict. What I have in mind in terms of lawless conflicts are such as the, the, the conflicts raging in 
Syria, uh, Iraq, with all these type of uh, uh, parties, uh, such as the so-called Islamic State, or some people prefer to call it Daesh for particular reasons, uh, pro and anti-government militia. The situation in Nigeria, I had the pleasure to be in Nigeria in 2014 for a month. I was training the National Human Rights Commission on monitoring, investigation, reporting of serious violations. And one of the issues there was that, um, you know, there are violations, big violations from Boko Haram, but there are also a lot of violations from the armed forces. And uh, so he, somehow you get more than one party in, involved in, in, in uh, serious violations, which amount to maybe not terrorism in a, in a technical legal sense, but such abuse that uh, it does much more harm than good. It's, it's much more than enforcing law and order. It's, it's stirring up much more uh, resentment and hate. So, um, and that, of course, was under a previous regime, and I, I, I'm not commenting on any particular government policy at the moment in Nigeria. And also, the, you know, we have Bukhari there, who's a different style than what we had under Good Luck Jonathan. A Central African Republic, we're seeing all sorts of violations there that, that ha seem to have uh, you know, a lawless character. And uh, some of these other conflicts, Northern Mali, we've seen uh, some really horrific things, uh, you know, targeting of cultural property. And I just read um, a lengthy article that said, I was very pleased to see, you know, that when the, 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 the archives of from centuries of, of the culture of the place, uh, Arabic trans, uh, you, know, you know, scripts that, are, that have a priceless value, 95% of them have been spirited away in the lead up to, to the assault on those uh, religious texts. So uh, those things are somehow safe. But you know, the, the potential damage there and the kind of violations that have gone forward there, it makes the world quake. And also in DRC, this, this uh, conflict has gone on for so long. And, and the other places I could mention there. I say maybe Pakistan, um, because you, know, you have Afghanistan, Darfur, South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen. They're, they're certainly um, serious violations. But many people are saying, well, you know, Pakistan's a little bit different because it's really um, criminal law enforcement. Uh, and it's very debated, debatable whether that's an armed conflict or not, however, because in uh, Khyber, uh, thank you very much, Pangtsunkwa, and in Waziristan, uh, you have a pretty long duration of uh, armed forces um, engaged. And also on the other side, you have uh, organized groups. The question is whether they're organized enough to, to uh, say that that's a, this is an armed conflict, this is, this is something one, one can discuss. But I'm not talking really about situations still considered below the Geneva Convention's threshold of armed conflict. And I mention these countries here, Honduras, Venezuela, and, and the others, um, even though they have really high homicide rates, murder rates, um, these are the top nine countries that the U UN Office of um, Drugs and Crime rated as the highest homicide um, countries. There's still issues that are being mainly addressed by the domestic criminal law with some support, uh, transnational and mutual uh, interstate cooperation. They're still mainly seen as, as, as criminal law problems even though they're difficult, rather than armed conflict. And some of these have been armed conflicts. Some of them have, um, may become armed conflicts, but right now they're still seen below that Geneva Convention threshold. But that's, you know, it's, everyone has their view, but uh, um, this is, this is uh, my perspective on, on that so far, loosely speaking. So some of today's uh, lawless conflicts, uh, I think we know, project um, you know, violence through terrorism. So if we just take the list, just take a random list from, say, 12 November to 25 January, the, the type of attacks we've seen outside these countries, which are big conflicts. So if you look at all these conflicts here, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. we see that you're seeing, um, you know, major violent attacks, terrorist attacks, in other places you wouldn't necessarily expect. 
So it, it was, that's why, one of the reasons why you know, Paris came as such a shock. Um, or you see uh, San Bernard, Bernardino, uh, you know, attacks in Quetta and uh, Diyarbakir in Turkey, etc. And you know, this is just a sample, as we all know. You can just open the newspapers and see every day or every couple of days there's a new attack or other. So it's um, the situation where, uh, as we're going to see, most of terrorism attacks are carried out uh, in armed conflict situations, and I'll show that in a moment. But they're also being projected in so many other countries that normally don't have um, this kind of terrorism these days. And so, uh, yeah, I'm just mentioning there are more attacks. There's, there's so many others we could mention. Now, terrorism itself is, 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 not, a, is not a new phenomenon. We are, I think we all know that. But the point uh, maybe I want to start off with is to say that today's terrorism uh, seems qualitatively different from that of past decades. And this was part of the uh, point I was raising in the, in the Guardian article. You know, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, you had groups like Acción Direct and Brigate Rose um, and Bader Meinhof, Front de Liberation de Quebec, and all these other groups that <coughs> basically targeted mainly the political independence of a single state. They were trying to, you know, influence a particular state. And the way they operated was mainly within the territory of one state, even though there was uh, you know, some transnational links and sometimes foreign support, but it was mainly, it was quite fairly limited. They could be countered mainly by domestic civilian and military law enforcement, which could target them basically as organized crime syndicates. So if you look back and you take a look at how these things were treated, how they were portrayed in the media. Um, there was always an international aspect, but mainly it was police forces, sometimes with the help even of military services, military forces, um, but still mainly as seen as a, you know, organized crime or as an organized uh, uh, criminal attack that was mainly to be dealt with from the domestic organs of the state. But now terrorism has become uh, integral to certain armed conflicts. The Global Terrorism Index notes that 80% of terrorist attacks were perpetrated in armed conflict situations. So it means that the, the character of armed conflict is, is changing. I mean, there are some groups, you know, the Vancouver-based group in uh, Simon Fraser University, which shows that the number of deaths overall in armed conflict has gone down quite a lot, statistically. And in a way, they're saying war is becoming safer and safer, in a way. Um, but on the other hand, if, if, it's, if there are more terrorist actions and we're getting movement away from regular uh, conventional warfare, the potential for uh, scaling up uh, through terrorism is, is there, and I'll make that point uh, again in a moment. So uh, you see um, you know, a rise in deaths from terrorism between uh, the years 2000 and 2014. That's, that's mainly uh, related to armed conflict situations. Now, <clears throat> When I've been listening myself to some terror, uh, you know, counterterrorism lectures and presentations, or you know, doing my own research, it sometimes crossed my mind that you know, we're actually talking about a very small number of victims, and the amount of, for example, money, and I didn't put that up there, but the amount of millions and millions, billions of dollars spent on counterterrorism and all the actions that governments take against terrorism. Um, makes you sometimes wonder, or made me wonder, why, I'll come to you in a second, you know, uh, if we look at the number of victims, it, it's, it's very small. And I, I'll just make this point and then I'll come to you. Sure, sure, sure. Um, President Obama made the point 
uh, last October that victims of gun violence far outnumber victims of terrorism in the United States. And there's a nice little graph that uh, shows, you know, over the same time period, almost, uh, you know, I mean, more than 400,000 deaths from gun violence and less than 1% from terrorism. Um, and that is, uh, you know, including the, um, the 9-11 attacks. So, you know, it's a very small percentage. But the point is, and maybe that says more about gun violence in the U.S., and we're not living in the U.S. also, um, than about the gravity of terrorism globally. But the thing I want to argue next is terrorism still, if the numbers of victims is rather, is rather small, you know, compared to, uh, you know, traffic accidents or disease, malnutrition, or other big killers, it's still qualitatively different, and it's still important for reasons I'll, I will uh, mention in a moment. Did you want to say something? Yeah, just uh, for clarification, just on your previous slide, you were, sure. you were talking about the number of uh, deaths from terrorist attacks in the course of armed violence, but how do you distinguish a terrorist attack in the course of armed violence or armed conflict from a regular attack? For instance, the Syrian government has been accused of committing terrorist attacks whilst using its own army. So how do you make the distinction here? Well, one of the distinctions would be that, you know, when, when we're talking about state, state forces, we are in a bit of a difficulty because they're prosecuting a war, and there's a default that they are um, preserving, the, they're internationally recognized in some way as preserving the, the sovereign integrity of the country. And that, that is the default position, uh, you know, until they start doing things outside the laws of war. Now, um, the difference between terrorism and just ordinary violations of the Geneva Conventions or great breaches would be something I'm going to get to, but it's the, it's the intention and, you know, as a campaign to try to uh, intimidate the population and try to force a, a change in government policy or the policy of an authority. So in a way that, that runs c contrary to the notion of, of uh, of a, a state prosecuting a war badly uh, as terrorism, but it, uh, it, but it could happen, and you could have state-sponsored terrorism. We know that, so that's it's difficult to distinguish. On the other hand, when you have militia, um, you know, trying to force government, it's it's easier to characterize it as that. So it's not a it's not a very um, clear answer that I can give you also in the abstract. I look forward to your elaboration. Sure, we can we can go on, but uh, but thanks for your question and uh, for for raising that. Let's go further. Terrorist attacks, and by the way, it also brings up definition, which is a, another issue I'll, I'll want to uh, revisit. So thanks again. Terrorist attacks, um, why are they still important, even though the numbers are small? That's where we were. Well, they deliberately maximize civilian ca casualties. It, you know, it's not, uh, you know, we have many more thousands of traffic accidents, but traffic accidents are, are serious. And they're tragic, but they're accidents. This is obviously, you know, deliberate, and, and it's it's got a different sense to it. And one of them is that it's trying to intimidate people and governments and instill fear, incite hate, and further attacks. And not only that, even if the numbers are fairly small in the global picture, um, they have been rising. So we've seen an increase according to the Global Terrorism Index, and I don't necessarily agree with all their categories precisely how they count terrorist uh, victims and terrorist incidents. I mean, we can debate. Again, it's another thing to debate, um, you know, what numbers. But um, I think most responsible um, researchers and observers have noticed that there is a substantial increase in, in the number of uh, deaths from terrorism uh, over the last several years. And you know, it also fuels xenophobia, racism, intolerance, as well as restrictions on human rights and fundamental freedoms. So the, the, the reaction that we're getting from governments and, and uh, also people's uh, willingness to, to give up their, uh, their human rights or to sacrifice some of them in some way. And there, I think that's an interesting um, graph from the Pew Research Center that, that shows um, you know, in Western countries and in Muslim countries, 
uh, that uh, you know the concern about Islamic extre extremism is is going up quite a lot over the last couple of years. Moreover, just to take this a little bit further, uh, today's terrorist organizations target economic and financial institutions, incurring substantial secondary economic and political costs, which go beyond uh, the number of dead and injured. So I think this is an overestimate. I think 3.3 trillion is too high, because that also includes you know, the cost of the early wars of, of the uh, early years of the Iraq conflict. So that's, that's, that's putting a big uh, cost in there. But some people are saying, and this is from the New York uh, Times article, um, well, it's 3.3 trillion is what the 9-11 cost is. I don't think it's that high, but in any case, um, it's hard to measure, and the costs are much more substantial in terms of economic, social, uh, financial uh, and uh, costs, and, and, and a difficult to measure, or possible to measure, um, chilling effect on people's lives and on political institutions. Some of today's terrorist organizations manage to evade detection through encrypted uh, protocols, so that's another challenge. Oops, I meant to take that off, but <laughs> it's still there. Um, they also use trade-based money laundering. So they're quite sophisticated, maybe much more so than in the past. Um, quite clever ways to get around uh, you know, money laundering um, controls. Um, the, the kind of controls we have on banks, uh, money coming in and out of you know, bank uh, accounts just doesn't seem to, to do it. There are so many other ways to move money and goods. Uh, and to launder value that uh, apparently it's, it's not working so well. The tools that we are using. Islamic State, for example, has managed to secure steady and substantial oil revenue. And um, some estimates are maybe $2 million, US dollars, uh, a day. <clears throat> and there you see quite a, quite a uh, list of its assets. And these are um, some graphs that are from the annual financial report of ISIS itself. <laughs> so they, um, you know, it's not that they're hiring Price Waterhouse Coopers or Ernst and Young or these other. Uh, they 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 have pretty good accountants of their own, and they also like to use computers. And these are their own graphs. These are these are were originally in Arabic. These ones they've been uh, changed into English. But this is one completely original one. And that gives a balance sheet. And just as you would go and uh, have a, an, a, a brochure for your organization, uh, the Islamic State also has a brochure that says, this is what you get for your money. Uh, this is what we were able to do last year. And next year, we, you know, we plan to go up 10%. And, and uh, you know, your money will be well spent. And so they, they list all the stuff. And, they, and, and <clears throat> some of the, the more gruesome things we see are, YouTube videos of you know beheadings and other atrocities, etc. But some of them are just these kind of graphs that they, they, they try to document everything to attract more funds. But they're getting even greater revenue from than from oil, from taxes, ransom money, extortion, levies on on minorities. So uh, quite a lot of funds coming in. And this is just a different ball game than we'd see in the 1970s and 80s which were really some Mickey Mouse, you know, no slur on Mickey Mouse, but, uh, you know, terrorist organizations in terms of sustainability. It was, you know, a couple of people banding together, some of them much more, you know, strong than that, but, but still, I mean, you, if you look at IRA and ETA, uh, they, they, they're sustainable organizations financially and organizationally much more than some of the others. But, so, you know, I wouldn't underestimate that either. But still, we're, this seems to be a different level than, than we're used to. And there's a reason for it as well. We'll get to that. So as if that were not enough, Islamic stale, uh, State has been trying to acquire material for a dirty bomb. And might, you might think, well, you know, that, uh, how, how, how is that really 
impossible. It might not be, it's just too difficult to do that. It's got to be technically difficult. But, um, you know, it doesn't take a lot to, to make one. There are some 70,000 devices with nuclear material in about 13,000 buildings uh, around the world, which have very low security or no security at all. So that's not that difficult to get. Um, so that's, that's a worry. Did you see that um, they just a couple of days ago, they picked up uh, uh, in, in the, uh, somebody related to the Paris attacks, a film of, uh, that, that, that they had taken of a nuclear official, a nuclear official in one of the, in, in Belgium, at a very weakly guarded, poorly guarded facility. So they're going to target that person. One way is obviously to try to grab their family, hold them ransom, and try to get uh, some material, um, or, or at least uh, access. So this is, this is a worry. The US National Security's um, <clears throat> Senior Director for Weapons of Mass Destruction said three years ago she was surprised nuclear terrorism hadn't happened yet, because it would be so easy to do it. Because you know, it's not, it's not uh, making a nuclear bomb you know, with fissionable material and the centrifuges and all that. It's just exploding stuff, uh, nuclear material uh, you know, above, the, above the city and, and dirtying up the place. <clears throat> As Islamic State has probably been trying to figure out, I, see, I should say very probably, it's quite clear, how to, de to deploy chemical weapons. So uh, just a few days ago, you're, you're getting, um, the United States has been interrogating people uh, one expert in Iraq on chemical weapons, for example. So all of this, the point of all this is to say that, well, we have fairly small numbers of victims so far, but there's a high potential for a ramping up of terrorist incidents, increased numbers of casualties, and sustained threat. So the potential is, is very strong. Islamic State also controls, and this is what's different than most terrorist organizations we've seen, is very large territorial expanse. That, that is another game changer. So, um, and it's living taxes, as I've mentioned, trying to establish a viable caliphate that ignores national frontiers. You saw them demolishing, uh, perhaps some pictures in the newspaper, demolishing the, the you know, uh, some of the, the guard posts between Iraq and Syria the other day. And that's another thing from their, that's their, their, from their state building manual that has uh, um, been acquired by uh, intelligence forces. They have a state building manual that shows how to, you know, um, capacity develop, uh, you know, the, the organs of the state. Um, I think if they applied for funding from UNDP, they would not get it. But, you know, it sounds like uh, a, a lot of the, the work that we, we do in human rights, uh, you know, we, we try to support the judiciary, we try to support the, the Human Rights Commission. Uh, I'd like to see an Islamic State Human Rights Commission or something. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very funny. I mean, they're, they're uh, in a scary type of way. But we're going to build a state and we're going to take, you know, uh, take the garbage out. They're fixing roads, they're running the hospitals, they're running schools in a really nasty, Harsh way, but they're 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 filling a gap there, and maybe um, the state um, did not do so well before, especially during time of armed conflict. Of course, it breaks down. All the while, strictly enforcing an extreme interpretation of Sharia law, and that is thrilling a lot of people. And they're offering people who you know may be feeling they're not sure who they are and where their loyalties lie and where they, what their place in society is, offers them identity, uh, even spiritual fulfillment, excitement and adventure. Come and you know, shoot this and learn how to sh shoot an AK-47 at some poor person, right? Is with his hand size behind his back. Um, all the while inciting you know, hatred, religious intolerance, and violence. Okay, so we're seeing a, a huge number of fresh recruits that again, in the 70s and 80s, you, you had these secret communications between people here and there, um, and, and, and you, know, you got bands and cells. You know, if you look at uh, you know, uh, left-wing terrorism in Italy, for example, that went on for a long time, but 
you didn't get huge numbers of recruits coming, you know, by the by the thousands. It was not like that. Or in, in some of the other, if you look at Front de Liberation de Quebec, for example, there's very small numbers. Here we're getting thousands and thousands of people. So today's lawless conflicts uh, in so many countries involve uh, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and all these kind of violations. These are, you know, um, kidnapped victims who are executed. Kenji Goto and, and this, this Jordanian pilot. <clears throat> All these uh, serious violations. So recall uh, Boko Haram, Chibok, the Chibok girls, uh, school girls, and the whole raft of violations across the board from human rights, humanitarian law, international criminal law. On the other side, even states which normally respect the Geneva Conventions have increasingly resorted to means and methods of warfare that international humanitarian law doesn't really recognize. I shouldn't say doesn't really, just does not recognize. And uh, there you have um, you know, some, some manuals from, from the uh, Army War College of the United States that, that have to do with, for example, covert operations. And when you have covert operations, the rules of engagement are rather less transparent and, and rather less in line with international humanitarian law than, than you would like if, if you're uh, inclined to support the rule of law internationally. Hybrid warfare strategies and non-uniformed personnel being used. Now, the whole purpose of having uniform personnel is that you're identifiable and you're accountable under international humanitarian law. And um, so if you uh, send people without their badges, obviously there's a problem there. Proxy forces and agents, private security companies, and mercenaries. Um, mercenaries have been around a long time, that's not so new, but they, they are still being used. And they tend to consider themselves beyond the reach of law and military discipline. New technology such as drones further complicates matters in terms of distinction between civilians and combatants, and sometimes seems to uh, approximate summary executions. It's, you know, um, prosecutor, uh, judge, jury, and executioner all in one uh, with you know, targeting somebody and then, well, we've found a militant. You're not, how can you be sure? And uh, often there's uh, issues of so-called collateral damage, et cetera, as well. But this, this, this also further complicates uh, the prosecution of the war by government. The U.S. bombed a médecin uh, Sans Frontières Hospital in Kunduz. Um, that was a really nasty one. A lot of people died. I commented on it um, in, uh, in the news about this because uh, you know, it's, it's worrying if there are big, serious violations that, that, that um, reduce the legitimacy of the warring parties in the field. Um, when we need the, the, the law to be respected by all sides, and at least to have those kind of res uh, constraints. That was a really bad bombing, um, and I don't say there was intention to bomb it, to bomb that hospital, but obviously something went wrong with the command and control in that case, which, uh, which is a serious issue. You can also recall Abu Ghraib, and the instructive case of Royal Marine Sergeant Alexander Blackman, I want to raise, who in September 2011, in Afghanistan, captured a seriously wounded Taliban operative. He took away his high explosive grenade, an AK-47, prevented anyone else from administering first aid, and then shot him dead at close range, and said, it's nothing you wouldn't do to us, some kind of reciprocity in his mind. Obviously, this doesn't go anywhere, fellas. I just broke the Geneva Convention. And this uh, image here is you know, he didn't realize that, you know, his, his, his uh, fellow trooper had the uh, helmet cam on. And that, that film was later on found by military police. And, um, you know, he was brought to trial. He was court-martialed, sentenced to life for the murder, and on, the, on appeal that was reduced to 10 years. The interesting thing, 
was that many questioned after that point, well, what's the real, really the point of having the Geneva Conventions uh, for one side? The other side is a bunch of terrorists. And you had um, armed forces personnel, you know, active service personnel, um, expressing their, their anger about this. And until the Ministry of Defense in, of the United Kingdom put a ban and said, you cannot show up. You're, you're, this is a, you know, you're non-political. You're, you're under, you know, you're not allowed to rally in front uh, of the MOD or anywhere else in, in front of the court to, to say that this person should, should not be held responsible under the Geneva Conventions. And um, you know, they, many people defied that in any case. So in The Guardian, I asked whether the Geneva Conventions uh, mainly to limit uh, you know, cruelty and wars fought by regular soldiers, possibly could apply to today's terrorist groups who don't wear uniforms, don't necessarily follow a regular, regular military command structure, and don't have any intention to apply international humanitarian law. The Geneva Convention, so, you know, these are the you know, requirements. Is it not impractical even dangerously naive to treat captured insurgents humanely when they wouldn't hesitate to execute you if you were captured and ter terrorize you in your own countries. And a lot of people are saying that. Well, you know, why should the, the coalition forces here, there, everywhere follow international humanitarian law if the other side is not doing that? And, and this gentleman is John Yu, who was the legal counsel uh, you know, who drafted the famous torture is okay, um, no Geneva Conventions for a side that doesn't, that breaks the Geneva Conventions, professor of, uh, of law. And he has a, a very nice smile there, but what he was saying wasn't necessarily a happy thing. So why not use enhanced interrogation techniques? It's another possibility. In exceptional circumstances, if it could yield critical information, that saves the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of soldiers and, and civilians. It's been the argument of a lot of people in the United States, uh, for example. And we have uh, this guy here, um, Dick Cheney's. I was a big supporter of waterboarding. I was a big supporter of the enhanced interrogation techniques. And if you've seen any of his more recent interviews, he's reiterating that position very strongly. And in the US, there is a strong um, tendency to say, you know, torture may be okay. It used to be in the old days, torture was taboo. Now they're saying, well, look, look at the situation we have. Maybe, maybe it's one means that we can use. And, you know, uh, on the campaign stump, that's a quote. I would bring back waterboarding, and I would bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding with this, you know, with this style of, uh, speaking, shall we say. All right. So, and just today you saw that, I um, thought <laughs> this was interesting, the, the Economist Intelligence Unit just today came out with saying that the biggest risks to world uh, security, uh, you know, are these things. And Donald Trump and the rising threat of jihadi terrorism are equal. So Donald Trump wins the U.S. presidential presidential election and the rising threat of jihadi terrorism are the same. <laughs> They're at the same level of threat to the world, says the Economist Intelligence Unit, which is, a, which is an index I, I enjoy and I, I respect quite a lot. But I thought that was quite interesting. It just came out you know, some hours ago. and uh, It's reported in the newspapers. So, but why stick with the Geneva Conventions? Is it really worth it? Well, the court martial appeals court in the sergeant Alexander Blackman case held that uh, he jeopardized other British service members' lives by going to extremes. So the word was going to get out, and then it was, you know, it's going to be a free for all. Jihadists will use his actions to radicalize others, encourage terrorist groups to fight UK forces, and exact more brutal retribution or reprisal. Uh, I'm not sure whether I find that all that convincing because I think they are bad enough already. They're already torturing, 
raping, beheading people anyway. So are, are they going to say, oh, now we're really going to do it? I, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, I, I would buy the argument in, in maybe other conflicts. I'm not sure it's so compelling. Maybe I have some other reasons. I would add, and I said this in the Guardian article, the Geneva Conventions set minimum standards. These are minimum standards, not maximum standards, of humane treatment, without which cruelty in wartime would be completely unlimited. So just throwing them out uh, opens up something which is uh, you know, the gateway to a worse hell. Ignoring, tolerating, or excusing war crimes from your own side corrodes everybody's respect for the principles of military necessity, proportionality, and humanity, and weakens respect for the international rule of law in general, which in turn increases the likelihood of further conflict. You're taking an, an important ingredient of peace and security out of the equation and say, uh, out of the equation and saying, well, you know, law doesn't really work so effectively, so let's just throw it out. When you do that, um, you, you, you are uh, removing an important break on, on atrocities. Even from a strategic point of view, uh, winning battles through murder, tor torture, summary executions, and other crimes is a sure way to lose the, the, uh, the war for hearts and minds, simply because it's bringing everyone down to the same level of the terrorist. And um, you know, it's even from a point of view of military strategy, it's it uh, it runs contrary to uh, you know counterinsurgency uh, strategies that you have to win people's trust and and make them like you and, and trust you and, and rely on you. Use of force is a small part of military strategy. It's legitimacy and morale that are more important. So you know th that makes a big difference in uh, longer-term conflicts. So, can international law address today's lawless conflicts? Well, the Geneva Conventions extend POW stat uh, prisoner of war status to lawful combatants, members of the armed forces, etc. Under responsible command, as I've said, we all know this, I think, uh, with fixed, distinctive signs, they have to carry arms openly conduct operations in accordance with the laws and customs of war. That kind of rules out POW status for captured terrorists operating in lawless conflicts, at least according to the Geneva Conventions the way they are now. But that doesn't mean that Geneva Conventions don't apply at all in so-called lawless conflicts. As we saw from uh, Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, that common Article 3 is a standard you can't go below. And that um, you know the United States said, well, okay, we're going to abide by it in any case, uh, even you know Article 75, Protocol One, even though the United States is not a state party. The point is, the Geneva Conventions are not particularly well suited to this kind of asymmetric conflict situation where one party deliberately violates rather than abides by international humanitarian law. Because you know, one of the premises of international uh, humanitarian law, and the Geneva Conventions in particular, is that you know, there has to be um, a willingness, uh, an effort, to apply the conventions. Otherwise, you're, you're really in a very difficult situation. Instead of saying, our intention is to violate the conventions. I mean, it's, what do you do with that? It's, that's more difficult. States have been cooperating to fight terrorism for a long time. We have all these conventions on terrorism. Um, in maybe 13 main areas, we have about 19 or 20 conventions. We have the United Nations Counterterrorism Committee and uh, all the cooperation through the Security Council. There's no, however, UN Convention Against Terrorism, nor an internationally agreed upon general legal definition of, of terrorist act. And I have only a few more slides, so bear with me. That prohibits uh, specific ways in which terrorism may be committed. So, uh, sorry, prohibiting specific ways in which terrorism is committed. If we go back for a moment, we see convention on offenses against, you know, aircraft, civil aviation, taking of hostages, nuclear material, you know, uh, bombings, financing of terrorism. All these, this approach that the, the international community has been taking 
over uh, many years is like saying, well, you know, it's like having different crimes. Murder with a gun, murder with a knife, murder with a stick, instead of prohibiting murder per se. Those are all aspects of terrorism. All these transnational um, counter-terrorism conventions that we have are pretty much specific ways to commit terrorism that are prohibited. So a comprehensive legal definition of the crime of terrorism could promote coherence, interstate cooperation, and effectiveness. The problem is states still disagree very much over what terrorism is, not so much over what it is, um, but what should be considered lawful exceptions to it, such as freedom fighters from colonial domination. Well, I think that's well, fairly well established. We have Protocol 2 on you know, supplementing Common Article 3 to the Four Geneva Conventions on non-international armed conflict, which legitimizes the use of force for national liberation movements. It doesn't legitimize terrorism by them, by the way. So it's not one person's. I, don't, I never agreed with this, with this phrase, one person's uh, uh, free, terrorist, freedom fighter, yeah. is, an, is another person's terrorist. I, you know, you know, you may be a freedom fighter and may be legitimate, but you still can't violate the Geneva Convention. So that, that for me, was a, always a phrase that has been mistaken. Right to use force against serious human rights abuse. I mean, if the government is really, I mean, if they're committing a genocide, can you use force? And maybe even that some of it constitutes terrorism to get the government to change its policy and then maybe has a transnational character. Would that then become terrorism? Um, what about the right to use force against cor a corrupt and ty uh, tyrannical regime? Um, you know, we have seen some interesting situations where people seem to get fed up with a particular regime and the excesses and thrown it off, perhaps encouraged by some governments or some forces outside the country. That's, that's another debate, depending on which country we're talking about. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon ruled that international customary law defines terrorism, terrorism to consist of commission of a criminal act, specific intent to spread fear or coerce an authority, and a transnational element. It's a very simple and I think fairly accurate um, definition which you could get from all the resolutions and, 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 and conventions and other uh, sources. That comes from the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. But the tribunal's assertion that a customary rule of international law recognizes a clearly defined crime of terrorism doesn't, really gl it doesn't succeed in glossing over the lack of clear and unambiguous agreement among states, uh, I, would, I would argue, on the legal definition of terrorism the permissible exceptions, and what are the state obligations and legal consequences for failure to prevent terrorist offenses and to extradite, prosecute, and punish offenders. And that's very important because we should know clearly um, you know, what, what, what happens to a state if, if it doesn't take the actions it's supposed to. Under the CTC, we have some rules. We could, there could be sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. And those are binding, would be binding on all UN member states. Chapter Seven of the UN Charter, but um, you know uh, we don't have that from any other source. Similarly, the ICC statute does not explicitly refer to terrorist offenses. Well, of course, everybody will say that uh, you know some of the crimes do, and I'll get to that in a moment. You know, I was at the Rome conference actually, and um, there were uh, moves to include terrorism, drug trafficking, certain other transnational crimes, but they were not included because it was felt that um, those treaty-based crimes were, uh, let's say, not so well established in general international law that they would garner the same level of support and uh, have the same international uh, status of law that we see in genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. So, plus they, they, it was also argued that you know drug trafficking and and terrorism may be very minor. And um, the court is supposed to really look at crimes of international concern, which somehow is uh, much more for the, uh, for the core crimes than for these things. So 
However, they may be covered indirectly uh, from the Rome Statute because a lot of the crimes that are committed uh, under these categories of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity also um, uh, you know, cover things that are typically done in terrorist attacks. The Netherlands again proposed, uh, they, they did it first at the Rome Conference, but they again proposed including <coughs> terrorism uh, you know, at the next opportunity at the Kampala ICC Review Conference in 2010. But the disagreement continues over definition. definition. Perhaps the answer might be to establish a permanent hybrid court mixing international law and uh, available um, domestic law. So that's maybe a possibility. To conclude, international law could meet the challenges of lawless conflicts, but only if the international community strengthens international norms and implementation rather than uh, casts law to the, to the winds updates the Geneva Conventions. There's always a risk in that. <laughs> we know, eh? Uh, we don't want to uh, have countries jump all over and say, oh yeah, yeah, we'll update them and then weaken them, right? That's a risk. Uh, but perhaps maybe an additional protocol on asymmetric conflict to reinforce minimum standards of protection. That's not going to prevent terrorist outrages, but it may um, prevent the slide into um, illegal and uh, opaque um, overreaction that is outside of uh, the, the normal constraints and the accepted limits of international humanitarian law, because that is a concern in terms of legitimacy and, and the long-term struggle. It improves mutual interstate cooperation for, to fight terrorism at regional and global levels. Um, it's a very squeaky, often not very well-functioning system that we have um, I think you know it's being strengthened these days in the European context, but um, with, with many countries, it simply doesn't function. It's too cumbersome to get information, to get intelligence, to share uh, up-to-date you know uh, information that could be turned into evidence, etc. But in order to have trust, to make mutual state cooperation work better, it means that every country has to up its game in terms of dem democratic governance, human rights, and the rule of law. For example, nobody wants to extradite a terrorist suspect to a country where there is uh, a lack of fair trial, where the judiciary is not independent, or where there is the death penalty. Some, many countries, rightfully in my opinion, have qualms about uh, the death penalty, and, and so that's another issue there. Um, defines. Uh, the international crime of terrorist offense in a comprehensive convention, it's a possibility. Perhaps update the Rome Statute. I, I think there's limited mm, prospect for that. It may not be real, very realistic to cover terrorism, but maybe, like I say, set up a permanent hybrid terrorism court. The international community has to respect the fact that international human rights law applies in time of armed conflict, and certain human rights cannot be derogated from any time. More broadly, intensify diplomatic, political, and strategic cooperation through the UN and regional collective security arrangements. I'd leave it at that and uh, open up the discussion and hope that uh, you found some of the ideas maybe interesting in, in the presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. I think it addressed many perspectives, problems, issues, legal fields as well. So I'm sure there will be many questions. Uh, my colleague Wim has a mic. To whom can I give the floor? Yes. Amen. Hi, my name is Eva Vukusic. I'm from the Utrecht University. I have two questions, I guess, or one question and one comment. Uh, the question relates to the people that are arguing for not applying the Geneva Conventions. Uh, conventions. What specifically do they have in, in, in mind? How this non-application would work? I'm just curious because I'm not sure, is, is this serious? Is there a serious movement for this? And uh, secondly, this relates to the use of torture. This is not my field, but I've read that even if you don't have a moral problem with it, it doesn't work. Like I've read studies that say we could do it, but like the results are not, it, it's just, it's not, you know, it, it may be attractive, but it doesn't work. So just kind of these two things, thank you. Thanks, uh, maybe I'll respond right away. Um, you're, yeah, sure. I think it works still. Now we're going to have double, double trouble. Um, I think your comment actually addresses your question. 
Um, so you may have answered it yourself, and and, and that I agree with you. Um, the evidence, and you can see this from the U.S. congressional hearings. It's very much in depth about waterboarding and other forms of torture. Um, you know that it's very unlikely that any actionable intelligence was gained. Right. And they're only able to show possibly two or three pieces of information. And the damage to your moral standing as a country is enormous. Um, and um, so the, the norms against torture uh, you know, have been under threat for years. And it's not just the United States. Um, I would I would say that um, you know the, the George Bush administration had it completely wrong, and I've I, me and many other people have always disagreed with that very strongly and vocally. And many good uh, you know American lawyers at you know in the country have, have raised it, and and, and uh, that's why we have Hamdan Rumsfeld in, the, in other cases. So so uh, to their credit, um, but uh, the administration got it completely wrong because it's just a very short-sighted thing. Aside from the practical aspects, um, it, it, it completely undercuts the enormous soft power that country has to say that, you know, we are above that, we are fighting the fair fight. And it, it, it will come down to legitimacy in any longer-term war. And that's just a way to throw it in the garbage. And terrorists love it. They say, wow, look, see, we told you, that's, you're unmasking who you really are. And I, I say it's not only the United States, because despite all the pronouncements, and there's only maybe a single country that for a while um, said that torture was okay, and even that got overturned by the Supreme Court, and I don't want to particularly mention it, which country it was. But every other country has said that, um, you know, uh, they respect the, the rules against torture. But we know that the practice of torture, statistically, has, has gone up quite a lot. And I, I think it was maybe Amnesty International or some other organizations that have, have documented the trade in implements of torture. And that shows a lot. Somebody's buying that stuff. And it's governments that are buying it. And the trade is, 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 is going up a lot. So, um, yes, is it, is it a serious... Um, Argument, where well, you had the uh, the uh, Bush administration pushing this argument and getting the legal opinion to say it was okay, and following it uh, in in uh, and saying waterboarding is not really torture and even maybe torture's okay in some way, and you're getting the, the Donald Trump right now arguing for it. Um, so yeah, you have people in serious positions, but the pe and what worries me more, or just as much, let me put it that way. It's people that are not arguing about it, but they're doing it, they're carrying it out in many, many countries of the world. So it's a big struggle and, uh, um, you know, that's, that, that would be my answer. Thank yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Yad Masood. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Paris S. I have a question uh, uh, concerning uh, the Paris attack. Um, it's a terrorist attack happening in uh, uh, peaceful times. So, uh, Paris was not under uh, uh, armed conflict. So, no, and then we have the president uh, Hollande saying that uh, France is in war, and that uh, the term war in uh, or la guerre is uh, as if it is an armed conflict, which has began all of a sudden in France, in Paris. Uh, is it sufficient uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to characterize an armed conflict with uh, only one attack and then all of a sudden uh, an armed uh, conflict uh, is raising and then we, are, uh, we, we, we apply the Geneva Convention and the international humanitarian law and, uh, till we, uh, and uh, what is the end of this armed conflict? This is the thing. And, uh, I think that we have to stick to the definition of armed conflict uh, given by the ICJ or ICTY that there is a, a threshold of intensity and all of the, uh, all those conditions of uh, the Geneva Conventions. Otherwise, we are th the whole world will be in an armed conflict, endless armed conflict, uh, forever. 
It's an excellent uh, question comment, and it's one I very much agree with. And I've always had uh, deep misgivings about the terminology, not just of François uh, Hollande, uh, but of uh, you know the global war on terror. Because in in, in one way, um, it, it ignores the the objective criteria that have been set very responsibly by states themselves through the good auspices of the diplomatic conferences of, of the International Committee of the Red Cross to say these are the criteria which some of them you just mentioned, which are spelled out in the Geneva Conventions and the protocols. And those, are, those, are the, those are the criteria that we have to respect. And uh, so you're correct. Um, and some, uh, I heard some colleagues uh, uh, saying um, when uh, the President uh, Hollande said, you know, this is a, this is a war. Uh, said, you know, uh, that happened. Um, they said, oh my gosh, they should never say that. And, and I was thinking at the time, yes, they're, they're right. And it, it also maybe dignifies the other side to say, you know, there's another warring party. That's also a risk. Rather than just saying what it is, it's terrorism, even though it's, it, you know, it's the most serious attack France had suffered since uh, world, the end of World War II. Um, but I, I, I don't want to pick on President Hollande because for the simple reason that uh, from from what I read and saw in, in the news, it looked like a war, and it looked like something horrific, really bad, and we were talking about big numbers. So I wouldn't pick on President Hollande uh, so much. I, I know that a president should be more careful with his language, uh, and uh, as a as a you know uh, internationalist and in, in law, I would say, listen, he, that's it's not a good thing to say, and it's not it's not even correct. But I can understand somebody saying that. And uh, instead of saying, oh, no, you can't say it. OK. Um, <laughs> I think he, one of the reasons he may have said it was to also uh, give uh, notice that he intends to follow up politically, but militarily, in Syria with armed force. Now, th that's maybe not the correct way to go about characterizing and say, this is a war now. Um, but certainly, the, the conflict in, in Syria, we can get into this argument as well, uh, to me, it looks like an internationalized armed conflict, mm -hmm. if not an international armed conflict. Um, and so, in, in a way, France is, I mean, in, is directly involved. They're, they're using their bombers, but that's in Syria, not in France. So, you, I agree with uh, your point, but I just maybe add those other comments there. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Dr. Sunga, my name is Khalid Ahmed Chaudhry from International Human Rights Commission. Following uh, Dr. Christopher, I also want to uh, s uh, say that my compliments on your highly qual qualitative, quantitative uh, presentation. And I could feel some sort of human touch as well into that. So it was not a, a, a presentation by a, a political or a, a scientist, someone, but you had something. I appreciate that. I have a very innocent sort of question. A no question is innocent, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> a US drone attack in Yemen kills a family of four or five. There is one survival. So the person who survives, the very next day, he kills a US soldier. So U.S. drone attack, which doesn't have any legitimacy because it is not allowed by the government of Yemen, but U.S. is just using uh, their power. So according to the Geneva Convention and the international criminal law, what will be the situation of this person who kills a soldier in response of killing their, his family? Because U.S. certainly will declare him as a, uh, as a terrorist or something. But if he kills uh, a US soldier responding to uh, uh, that situation, so uh, if you can tell us, please. You, you know, it's a, it, it's a, it's a great um, case to discuss in a classroom at length because it raises many, many different uh, issues which are uh, not hypothetical. They're very real issues, and they, they do happen. And it is, it is such that um, it, it, it's getting, it's raising a number of issues all at once, which, which I, I, we, I don't think we could possibly solve all at once. But let me just maybe highlight a few of them, which, which I think are 
uh, you know, raised very well in your question. One of them is that you know it's not very clear uh, the, the legality um, of, of drone attacks. And that's why I registered my disquiet with drone attacks, because it is um, uh, fighting at a distance. There's a question as to whether the, the, the appreciation uh, of the distinction between civilians and, and combatants uh, can be responsibly made. Um, but even if we get around that and say, well, we've, we've identified very well that these people are uh, you know, carrying out these attacks, then you're caught in a, in a bit of a dilemma. Because on the one hand, if if it's a criminal law issue, then you know there are rules in international law governing the use of uh, armed uh, of, of firearms uh, for criminal law enforcement, which are very strict, and you know we have those guidelines, and and uh, it's not intended unless there's an imminent threat or self-defense. That's the very basic rule. Uh, you're not allowed to be shooting people. So you know. Self-defense or imminent threat against you know another uh, uh, person or target, um, you can use you know proportional even then proportional and strictly limited uh, force. So that would be the criminal law, but it's beyond the criminal law situation. It's it's an armed conflict, uh, and um, but here we're talking. This is this is not regulated clearly. Um, by by international humanitarian law because we have, you know, I'm not I'm not saying there's a legal vacuum. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't say that because that, for me there is no legal vacuum. Human rights applies, humanitarian law applies, and you know norms of international criminal law. So I wouldn't like to say that there are legal black holes, which is very convenient for some uh, states to, to to say that. But um, the use of drones and the way they're being used. As as uh, you know, it, but there's no effort. There's no possibility to disarm a person, uh, to give them a, a trial, which is what the Geneva Conventions would would, would require. It, it's really a summary execution policy. Um, and you know, if if we're talking about combatants, and you know that they're combatants, and then you're in less of a problem, because you know, in, in war. You don't just have a right, but you have a duty to kill. Killing is different. It's not. It's not murder when a soldier is shooting at another soldier, or even a rebel force, if it's if it's lawful. So it, it raises all this quagmire that um, is very uncomfortable uh, to give a straight answer, a clearer answer than I can give at, at that. But I could say that you know, um, it's it, it's also it's also maybe understandable somebody. I, impassioned and enraged would do something like you know take revenge but this is one of the problems that comes down to why we need you know rule following and and uh, to have these issues cleared up because the rules have to be clear because um, prosecution of war itself has to also be legitimate in its means and methods and and this gets us into a quagmire that I couldn't say more about than that hope that maybe gives you a response you're welcome <laughs> David Berg, one of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Uh, I congratulate you on your address and the elegant way you dealt with our judgment uh, in relation to a definition of terrorism. I can't, as a member of the court that decided that, uh, uh, argue it was either a good decision or it wasn't. But the topic is one of very great importance. It's been 78 years since the first international attempt to find uh, a convention referring to Article 38, which I have open, of the statute of the International Court of Justice, which is the first of the four means of finding law that talks about. Well, 78 years is rather a long time. The need for a common definition couldn't be clearer when ISIS are operating across borders in every direction, for the international community not to have a single rep to pull on uh, is uh, absurd and uh, hugely dangerous. And the Security Council is constantly talking about terrorism. Its resolutions are full of it. And when you actually do as you helpfully did, indicated, and sketch 
lines across a point or points. Where, the two, where do the 250 definitions of ter terrorism coalesce? And in the middle, there's a great black uh, bullseye that all the lines they do. cover, uh, which is, uh, I don't doubt, something that was in the mind of the Lebanon Tribunal. I don't speak for it at the moment. Uh, the other uh, bits of Article 38 are, of course, international custom as evidence of a general practice. Well, when you look at where the lines go, that's a pretty good evidence of custom. And then you have the general principles of law about which the same thing can be said. And then finally, we come to you and your colleagues, uh, the jurists, the most highly qualified publicists. We had a crack at Well, that. thanks for saying that, but I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> but we had our, our crack at it, right or wrong. There's been those who uh, disagree emphatically and those who support it. But those who disagree never come up with a positive answer. In England, this, I can get it finished, uh, there was the big issue about whether or not helping someone to take their own life was a breach of the, Section 2 of the Suicide Act. The law lords got very angry with the government and the parliament and said, it's taken you 12 years. They haven't come up with uh, whether or not this is lawful, what the limits are. And the judges actually have a job to step in. And we give you notice that if you don't, we will. Well, of course, parliament did and disagreed with what the judges had intended to do. So it's just as well the judge, judges didn't uh, step in. But since Calvin's case in 1605, it's been the judge's job uh, to protect the citizen and ultimately to step in. And what I would like to see is some academics step up, face this one, and without asking for a perfect <coughs> version, which you can get from international treaty, say, well, there is a minimal bullseye, a zone uh, in which all the material criteria meet. Let's call that terrorism for purposes of international criminal law. What's your reaction to such a proposal? Yeah, I don't have any disagreement with you at all. And uh, you know, I thank you for your kind comments uh, and, and, and saying that, um, you know, that, that it's helpful to have that, that kind of debate that, and, and the question. The, the, um, I don't think there's been any lack of Article 38.1d sources about, you know, on terrorism in the sense that in a sense, there's been so much written about it. So I think there's no, been no lack there. And I think they have looked, uh, if you look at all the, you know, dozens of articles on, uh, on, on the definition of terrorism, they do come to a fairly, uh, you know, the common denominator comes, common denominator comes down to what, uh, you know, was probably Antonio Cassese's inspiration, the late Antonio Cassese. Uh, you know, that these three elements are what you find in all these definitions. Um, not just from scholarly opinion, but also from conventions and, and state practice. The, um, and, and I think that was very useful that he did that, because that's a judicial pronouncement which has much more status than, um, than, than the other sources of law. Uh, and now general principles of international law, we could, we could glean that from the state practice of the courts. But that was not the original uh, that was not the um, original concept of what does mean general principles of law. When um, Ricci Busati was uh, uh, proposing it in the uh, statute of the Permanent Court of International Justice in 1922, what he was arguing, uh, you know, the Italian jurist, what he was arguing was that um, general principles of law should be a filler. Uh, where we don't have enough conventions and clear customary rules of international law that can be gleaned from the logic of the law itself to avoid non liquet That is, there, there's not enough law. And, and that we can decide the decision. Now, for me, norms of terrorism, which is a substantive issue, doesn't necessarily uh, you know, intuitively fall into general principles, except we could say maybe, well, it comes from order public in some way, perhaps. I mean, we could make that argument. So, uh, uh, but, but for me, um, I've, I'm still a little bit hesitant 
that if uh, could 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 uh, the special tribunal for Lebanon do by its lex specialis? Could it could it could it in this pronouncement do what a what states have been un unable to do, and that is to say, okay, now we all agree on a clear legal definition and agree to be bound by it. I think we need a convention, and I, I very much agree with that. Um, you know, point that you're making, I think, as well, is that it would be good to have states step up to the to the task and say, listen, you know, the def defining it is not that much of a difficulty. The exceptions, it's a little bit more problematic, but you know, let's get the job done. It's been in the uh, in the uh, legal committee of the uh, United Nations for for decades, and it's not been going anywhere. Partly because states do not, they want to reserve. For me, this is the biggest problem. They want to reserve the right, as a matter of territorial sovereignty, political independence, and their own policies, to be able to support movements. They think, uh, you know, armed force movements and the right to use violence against governments they don't like. We and it comes down that's that's a that that is a brick wall in this so far. Well, we use the Nicaragua uh, principle as a means of yeah. sanding off uh, idiosyncratic objections. And uh, at all events, uh, that's not the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something very much I agree with. And uh, you know, your, whole, your whole perspective on it is something I agree with. I share, this, share, share the same concern. So thank you for that. Any other questions at this stage? Yeah. Maybe Chris. Yeah. Thank you. Shachar Berio from the Embassy of Israel, from the International Law Department. Personally, regarding the definition of terrorism, uh, those are very important points. Um, throughout the last two weeks, I saw the Marshall Islands uh, debate in the International Court of Justice what the meaning of the word dispute means, just the plain word of dispute. So I don't think that if we even get to a definition of terrorism, we still stop all debating of who is a terrorist and what is a terrorist organization. I, I, I just think it will change the, way, the problem to another direction. Um, the Honorable Gentleman mentioned the House of Lords. I will mention the Supreme Court of the United States that, referring to pornography, stated that uh, one of the justices said that I know it when I see it. So it may be another type of strategy to maybe have a list, like many uh, organizations have, of what we identify as a terrorist activity, as a terrorist organization, and that is maybe practical enough to, if all parties relevant agree, to ha as, a, as a solution to the definition problem. Just my opinion. My question regards the latest uh, approach by the UN, uh, which Israel is uh, endorsing also uh, regarding uh, the um, combating violent extremism uh, in the sense that uh, we see the problem as the ideology driving those acts that lead to various complexities and and to those crimes and to addressing the, um, the, the, the root of the problem in the ideological sense or in the ed education level what is your opinion on this approach? What are the advantages or disadvantages that you identify? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, your point on uh, countering violent extremism is, is very well taken. Um, in particular, the the uh, approach. I mean, if we're really talking about you know terrorism uh, in in its larger perspective, um, root causes has to be very much part of the picture. Uh, you know, addressing root causes. So, and, and, and countering violent extremism is, is you know, looking at uh, education and uh, try to understand people's motives and, uh, you know, the human security aspects uh, that, that drive uh, terrorism and, and marginalization, etc. So th there's, a, there's a whole wider debate there that, that of course, uh, I would agree with. And so, um, on, on, and on the question as to whether maybe we really need a definition or not, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm partial to your uh, to to the view that it's not always necessary. I mean, we have, for example, uh, the right of peoples to self determination. It's a very important right, and it's you know it's it's in uh, Article One of 
both of the you know, the covenants, international covenants, and it's in the UN Charter. Um, it's, uh, but we don't really have a definition of a people. We have minority rights, but we don't have a very clear definition, except at the regional level here or there, on, on what is a minority. And we have you know, certain reports from the UN and certain indication, indicators of criteria. Um, so one, one can get away without definitions. But on the other hand, if we are moving towards um, you know, greater uh, coordination, international cooperation, and uh, prosecution of terrorists, for those things, you do need as clear, uh, you know, legal norms as possible to make the the um, expectations clear. What are the state obligations? Uh, and um, people that get involved with terrorism, they, sh they, sh they, sh they, sh it may be some comfort to them. They say, well, nobody knows really what it is. It depends on, you know, we know it when we see it, but we don't agree. You know, we have our own view, and we don't, we don't see it that way. Uh, you know, if you have a clearer definition, even if it's a broad one. Uh, maybe that's better than, than uh, leaving it open because that means that you are still always at square one in terms of um, moving beyond it. And, and I agree with your other comment is that defining it doesn't solve it, but it may be one important step towards taking other legal measures because then you have a definition more of what you're talking about, even if it's not very precise. So I, uh, I see your point and uh, I'm leaning towards we know that we do need a definition. Uh, that is more comprehensive than these specific kind of definitions. But I also see, you know, your side of the argument too. So, yeah, thank you very much. Do you have time for any other? Is there somebody else? <coughs> Otherwise, you will get the last one. Then you Sorry. will get the last one. <laughs> thank you. My name is Tamara Quiroga. I'm from Buenos Aires University. Uh, very interesting your presentation. I could like a short question because I know we do not have much time. Um, I would like more information about your idea about the permanent hybrid terrorism court. Um, will it be uh, uh, set up by international treat or maybe by the UN uh, Security Council? What is your idea? I, I would like to know more about that because Everybody, every country agrees about the, the importance of uh, terrorism. Every country condemns it. Uh, I think we are all agree about the, the need of uh, definition. Mm -hmm. I know that's, that's very difficult, but I think it's very important about the conviction of, the, of a terrorism. And I, I, I was not um, aware about that idea, about the permanent hybrid terrorism court. I think it's very difficult to set up one. Uh, the other choice that you brought up uh, was uh, to update the Roman Statute of the International Criminal Court. I think that is tougher, that uh, set up a permanent hybrid uh, terrorism court. I would like to know more about that idea. Sure, thanks very much. First of all, I, I want to, um, in, a, in all academic honesty, say that that's not my no, idea. I know. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And I only, I only, I uh, from, from somebody right. named Aaron Cregan, and who's uh, working at the U.S. Department of Justice. So okay. all credit for the okay. idea yeah. goes to her completely. But at least I, I saw it. <laughs> and um, and and why I found it attractive this this argument. Maybe that's what I could comment on. It's because um, the special courts have been remarkably. Um, much easier to make them function well. We've seen, uh, you know, I mean, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon is is is, is a bit where has has been more problematic because it's objectively very difficult. And the circumstances, and, you know, uh, I, I was actually at Rafiq Hariri's uh, uh, when he was lying in state. And I took a beautiful picture there, and you know, I was there before the. The, uh, the bombing and afterwards. Don't, I'm not <laughs> implicating myself. I, I was terribly, terribly shaken by what happened there on the, on the 14th of uh, February of, of that year. Um, and um, it, it, it's, uh, it's very difficult circumstances. But if you look at the special and tribunals and hybrid courts where they've been mixing domestic law with international uh, law, uh, you know, one can make a, one can make a case that they have worked rather well, you know. The special, uh, you know, if, you know, on, you know, uh, Charles Taylor was going over the ICC, but the Sierra Leone 
and, uh, and, and, and the special tribunal. And one could, I wouldn't argue the um, extraordinary, you know, Cambodia, it, 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 extraordinary courts and in in chambers in the yeah. courts of Cambodia. It's a long title. You know, I was, I was there, I was um, uh, there at the first trial of D Dutch was there. I happened to show up there. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was remarkable to see this mathematics teacher uh, who was running S21, who was also there this, th the same day, and saw you know this torture chamber. So that, that was a whole school, which he ran meticulously, count, counting all the numbers and making it run well. Um, but that was that's that's not a good example. It's not worked very well. But I think the special tribunal for Lebanon shows a lot of uh, you know potential for working well if we can get a hold of more people and get a hold of this particular suspects, um, and and the Sierra Leone court. It's been easier to get those things moving. Uh, the ICTY and ICTR, uh, they've done remarkable work, but it's it's been difficult. And the ICC has, has, has had an uphill battle because institution building is very difficult. Um, so I think that maybe a specialized court would avoid the problem where you say some, you know, some countries are already trying to think that maybe we shouldn't be part of this. And this will give them a perfect excuse. For, and in the case of the ICC, you know, you're seeing some backlash in some African countries to say, listen, you know, this is uh, enough for me, for us, uh, and and that that's the camel that breaks the, you know, that's the straw that breaks the, breaks the camel's back. So uh, maybe um, updating the Rome Statute would be problematic. But those countries that are more like-minded may spearhead uh, a, a permanent court that, as I say, could mix um, domestic law of a case where, you know, that, uh, you know, on the, let's say according to territory or nationality of the, of the person or victims um, uh, and, and fill it in with international law. So I think it's an interesting idea. I haven't looked into it. Sure, why not? I mean, instead of ad hoc. Um, and have it uh, as a standing court. Permanent courts are always better because every time you have to marshal the political will to set up a, a new ad hoc court, it's a very cumbersome process. And that's one of the reasons why you know we've moved from uh, the ICTY and ICTR. And I was involved with uh, in the early days of the establishment of the ICTR back in '94. I was very proud of being involved there. Um, but you know we, was, we were very conscious of the fact that. We were able to get, um, you know, the ICTR established. I think 13 votes to, you know, two abstentions of Rwanda and one other country, maybe China. No, China was. Uh, I don't remember now. But um, there's been no uh, international criminal court for uh, DRC, which has had many, many more deaths. Maybe three, four, five, six million, depending if you take the Ituri one and Ituri two conflicts and and all the all the deaths because the the political will is not there. Um, so, if you're setting it up to the Security Council, you have trouble, and if whatever mechanism, whether it's to the General Assembly, there has to be a mechanism for ad hoc tribunals, then you're getting back into political will, and and it's retrospective, and you have to wait till there's so many deaths to get the political will going. That what's the point? But if you have a permanent court, standing court, um, that maybe uh, assures countries. That we're going to use your law, but just where it's you know that we're going to make sure that it is um, in conformity in conformity with the international standards. That may be reassuring to countries that that want that want to have this objective and independent uh, forum that may help them decide these kind of cases. So that's that's an idea, and that's just some thinking on it. But as I say, one would have to uh, uh, look into Aaron Creekin's article for for much more extensive argumentation, which. Uh, I think you might find interesting as 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 I did. So thanks very much. Perhaps for uh, for a new lecture. <laughs> thanks for for that suggestion. Um, in view of the time, I think unfortunately we have to conclude. But maybe you can ask the question later as well. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for coming to the Austrian Institute. Of course, in particular, Dr. Sunga. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have some new lectures coming up at Asse. For example, on the 12th of April, uh, Alexis Demirjan from the ICC and Norman Guibert from the ICTY, they will provide a lecture entitled The Legal Ramifications of the Armenian Genocide, Compensation, Genocidal Intent, and Failure to Prosecute. And end of May, we'll also organize a book launch uh, on foreign fighters on international law. Uh, but there are more events in the pipeline, so please check the Asse website or better um, sign up for our newsletter. 
And finally, please note that increasingly our lectures are being recorded and that they will be posted online on our International Crimes Database at uh, internationalcrimesdatabase.org. So uh, please have a look there as well. Um, thanks again for coming and uh, enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thanks.